Hi, I'm Dan Sullivan, the President and CEO of the Grand River Dam Authority. The GRDA was created in 1935 by the Oklahoma Legislature as a conservation and reclamation district for the waters of the Grand River. The Grand River that comes to the Pensacola Dam behind me forms now what's called the Grand Lake of the Cherokees. That watershed extends well up into Kansas, Arkansas, and Missouri. About a third of our watershed goes into the state of Kansas, and the overall watershed is somewhere around 12,000 square miles. What this program, Guard the Grand, is all about is in cooperation with the Environmental Protection Agency and other partners, we've received a grant that will help you understand the importance of what we all do as an impact on our water quality and the ecosystems that surround Grand Lake. One of the things that, that we really have been trying to accomplish through this program and other educational opportunities is letting people know that when you live in the watershed, what you do in your yard, in your home, and all around you has an impact on a greater area far beyond where you live. And that 12,000 square mile area culminates in water that comes all the way to the Pensacola Dam behind me. That is what we're trying to do, to make sure that people understand that you can do something that impacts water quality and the systems all around you for generations to come. We thank you for being interested in this Guard the Grand program, and we look forward to you joining us as, as a guardian of the Grand. Thank you. Thank you for watching one of our pre-recorded workshops to help you better understand how you can help protect Grand Lake. But I want to start out with a little uh, short presentation on what Guard the Grand is. It's GRDA's Watershed Conservation Program. And this is just the Grand Lake watershed. If you look at the uh, large green area, that is the Grand Lake watershed. And a watershed is just an area of land when water falls in it, it, one, it drains to one location. So Everything that happens in the green area ends up at the end of Grand Lake or the Pensacola Dam and then goes on downstream. So everything that happens in here affects our lake. So you might think, man, that's a big watershed. Part of it's in Kansas, part of it's in Missouri, some of it's in Arkansas and just uh, small parts in Oklahoma. How can I make a difference? One way you can make a difference is to think that we all live in a watershed, whether it's the big Grand Lake watershed or even just the smaller, for example, the lower Honey Creek watershed right here. So if you make a difference in that small watershed, then ultimately you're going to make a difference in the larger lake as well. So I like to sort of um, think of it as we're doing something small for something big. So you, you've heard the saying, think globally, act locally. It's the same kind of thing. Think watershed wide, but act locally. So anything we do in any of these smaller watersheds is going to have an impact on the lake. I'm going to start off a little bit with some of the water quality impairments in Oklahoma and why does it matter to Grand Lake in particular. This information comes from the 2018 Oklahoma 303D list. And what that list is, is a list of impaired waters. And what it means to be impaired is each water segment is assigned what they refer to as a beneficial use. And a beneficial use is what that water is used for. Is it drinking water or is it a combination of things? Drinking water, recreation, fish and wildlife pop propagation, uh, agriculture, livestock watering, crop irrigation. Um, so there's several beneficial uses in, in the state of Oklahoma and each, each water body is assigned one. And when it's impaired, what it means is there's enough of a particular pollutant that's not allowing it to meet that beneficial use. So for example, if a water body is impaired for E. coli, then maybe when you get in that water, you don't necessarily wanna get your head in the water. So maybe it's not safe for primary body contact. Uh, which would be like swimming. Maybe it's okay for secondary body contact, which would be wading, but you kind of need to know those things, right? So we have this list of waters and actually about 70% of them are impaired for excess pathogens and that's just bacteria. And it can be E. coli, it can also be enterococcus and it can come, and it, there's some others and it could come from a lot of different sources. So it can come from wild animals, it can come uh, from livestock, 
It can come from your pet in town that you didn't even really think uh, when they poop in the yard that ends up in a stream or river, but it does. And uh, it can also come from human waste. So uh, we need to you know, figure out how to clean those up. 22% of total impaired miles are due to turbidity. And turbidity would be things like uh, algae in the water and too much sediment. So uh, sunlight can't get through or the algae is just um, so heavy and you can't, the water's not clear anymore. 22% are impaired for low dissolved oxygen, which the fish and bugs that live in a stream need that dissolved oxygen to breathe. If there's not enough, then that can cause issues. 18% are due to total dissolves, are impaired due to total dissolved solids. And that can be things like minerals, including like salts, especially if you think about in the winter when we've had an ice storm or a snowstorm and we salt and sand the roads, all that's got to go somewhere and ends up in our stream. So sometimes we'll see high chloride levels, especially in the winter. And all of that, all of these impairments come from uh, different sources, and those sources can include urban stormwater runoff. And stormwater runoff is just when rain falls on the land and it flows over it, it picks up everything with it. You know, water's the world's best solvent. So everything's clean after a rain event. Well, it's carried all that water into a stream or river. And it happens both in an urban setting uh, through our storm drains or storm sewers. Uh, it happens from construction site and it happens in rural areas due to agriculture um, or just, you know, residents living out in a rural area can have that impact. In the Grand Lake watershed in general, some of those issues are turbidity. Um, we get a lot of sediment, in particular from the Neosho River that feeds Grand Lake. We do have some issues in areas with bacteria, uh, some with nutrients, which would be too much uh, fertilizer in the water, like phosphorus or nitrogen, uh, and then too much low dissolved oxygen. Or, I'm sorry, low dissolved oxygen is one of the other issues that we can have. And these, again, are causes from erosion, agriculture uses, and urban stormwater runoff. So you might think, well, what can I do? Well, there's a couple of things that you can do. Um, first, I want to talk about the Guard the Green program, because that's one way that you can learn how you can make a difference. Um, it started a few years ago. The idea started a few years ago, and we applied for and received an Environmental Protection Agency Environmental Education Grant to, to conduct some residential workshops. So we're doing a series of informational and how-to workshops on a lot of different topics. The how-to workshops will probably be more uh, in the springtime. Right now we're doing mo more of the informational ones. And then we provide test kits and rain barrels to residents to help them implement a best management practice, which is how we can make a change. And then we're going to be working with businesses to do some develop, professional development workshops on things like erosion and sediment control, um, visit with landscapers about how they manage the, the, the lawns that they take care of, um, dock maintenance businesses, things like that. And then uh, through education. So, Reaching the kids, that's kind of one way to help get the message out there and let them uh, learn at a younger age. So we developed some watershed specific lesson plans for fourth grade teachers because that's when they start teaching a lot of the earth sciences. And it's targeted to Grand Lake. So as the students that live in the watershed are learning about erosion, they're gonna be able to tie it back to where they live and see what impact they can make or see what impact it is having on their watershed and where they live. And we did a series of workshops for teachers and we'll be doing some more in the future to give them those lesson plans. And then we're able to also provide some grants to the teachers and the schools to help implement some kind of best management practice to help further educate the students so it's not just a one-year thing. And the goals are really to help residents, businesses, and lake users to understand the impact that they have on the watershed, both the positive and the negative impacts. Because sometimes you're doing something and you're just going along and maybe you have a mulching attachment on your mower and you think, well, that's just how I mow my lawn. I've always done it that way. Well, that's a good thing because you don't have grass clippings um, that you're having to bag up and take to a landfill or that are getting uh, washed into the streams and rivers, you're leaving them on the lawn and they're actually helping to um, uh, improve your soil and provide some nutrients back to the grass. And then you might be doing something that you think is the right thing or not even just something that you've kind of always done and you don't realize that it can have an impact. 
And so letting people know what some of those um, negative impacts are. For example, we'll go back to the grass mowing. Let's say you mow your lawn and then you blow all the clippings into the street and let the water carry it down to the storm drain and into a stream or river. Well, that can have a negative impact on that lake. So you might not realize that it can have that negative impact. A lot of people don't necessarily know that, but it is a negative impact. And so by, by letting you know what those um, items are, what those actions are that can have that impact, then we can hopefully help you make more informed decisions about how you're managing things. And then again, to think that we all live upstream and downstream of someone. Um, I said it earlier, think watershed wide, but act locally. So remember that Honey Creek watershed, we can act in there to make a difference in Grand Lake. And then that all spreads downstream. If we have cleaner water in Grand Lake, Hudson has cleaner water, Fort Gibson has cleaner water, ultimately the Arkansas River and the Mississippi River. So um, we impact a lot more than we think we do. So how can you get involved? Well, one way is just to attend a workshop. So if you're watching this workshop, feel free to get in touch with us and we're happy to send you a, a sticker or something. Um, implement a best management practice at your home or your business. Install a rain barrel. Um, that's a, something pretty simple and fairly inexpensive that you can do to kind of help reduce stormwater runoff. Um, maybe if you're going to plant a new garden, do it more as a rain garden versus a traditional garden. And we have information on our website on how to do that. Get your soil tested. Know what fertilizer that you need before you put it down. If you just go to the store and buy the bag of fertilizer that says NPK, that's got nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in it, uh, you might not need the nitrogen. So if you get a soil test before you fertilize, that can help you save a little money because now you're only buying the fertilizer that you need, if you even need it at all. Ensure that your septic system is properly functioning. Um, they can leach bacteria, they can leach nutrients, so make sure everything's functioning right. Um, check it every few years, maybe have to get it pumped out every five years or so, but check it and make sure that things are working right. Maybe think about changing your mowing practices. I mentioned getting a mulching uh, attachment for your mower that helps leave the grass on site and can help improve soil health. Or maybe don't mow your grass so short, instead of mowing it two inches, mow it two and three quarters. That actually helps retain more moisture in the soil and you don't actually end up having to uh, water as much if you can do that. So think about those things. And then we also have a Guard the Grand app coming soon where you'll be able to just kind of look at your phone and have the information available for you. All of our informational pamphlets are on there and we'll have some information about the bugs that live in our streams and lakes and a little bit on water quality. So watch for that. We hope to have it alive in a couple of months. And then you can visit our website at grda.com and on the right hand side, there's a link for Guard the Grand. Uh, we have all of our informational pamphlets on things like pollution prevention, how's, how, to, how to manage your hazardous waste, where to dispose of it, um, landscape, uh, landscaping and lawn care tips, uh, how to build a rain garden, how to install a rain barrel, uh, boat and dock maintenance, and just the list goes on. So we've tried to provide resources uh, for you to be able to think about how you're doing things and see if there's something that you might want to change. And then if you have questions, just contact us. We're happy to visit with folks, answer questions, um, visit the GRDA website, um, or you can email us at guardthegrand at grda.com or email me personally at jerry.r.fleming at gmail.com. My phone number is also listed there. I'm happy to either text or call or visit with you, um, answer your emails. And then the GRDA Ecosystems and Watershed Management Department phone number is listed here as well. So if you have questions about permitting or anything else, they should be able to direct your call. So thank you for um, watching our videos. And uh, if you have any questions about the Guard the Grand program, again, feel free to reach out. Or if you have questions about the videos uh, that you, uh, after you've watched the video, also feel free to watch out. And we thank you and we look forward to you helping us guard the grand. So I'm going to talk now a little bit about shoreline erosion and vegetation management. Mostly I'm going to talk about erosion and then I'm excited that we have um, Dr. Bruce Hoagland here. Um, maybe you can see us see him there, he's waving. Uh, he works at, for the Oklahoma Biological Survey. He's also a professor at the University of Oklahoma. So I'm going to talk a little bit about shoreline erosion. And there's two kinds of erosion, or two ways to classify it. Um, natural erosion, 
which it, we, you know, are familiar with, think about the Grand Canyon, right? It's relatively slow and sometimes it's re re referred to as geologic erosion. But it happens most ha rapidly along the shorelines and along stream banks because you've got the force of the water um, constantly sort of hitting it. And it only produces about 30% of the eroded sediment in the US. Accelerated erosion, on the other hand, is really due to human activity. We've done some things to change the landscape and now we're increasing that erosion. Most of it as a result of construction, timber, and agriculture practices, and it accounts for about 70% of eroded sediment in the US. And sediment is the number one water pollutant um, kind of across the US and in Oklahoma. So it's, it's certainly an issue. And then there's different types of erosion. There's wind erosion where you're maybe gonna um, uh, pick it up and put it in the air, which is suspension. There's creep where it's just gonna roll along and then saltation where it's gonna hit and then go up and bounce and then hit, send more uh, particles up into the, to the air. I don't know if you remember this summer, right? We had the Sahara uh, sands come over. So that, that sand was suspended in the air and then it can fall out with rain. And then there's um, slumping where maybe you've got waves undercutting a a bank or a hillside. Sometimes you'll just see sort of big chunks of it slump off. Um, soil creep again. And then uh, splash erosion, which happens as the result of raindrops on bare soil. And it really, uh, that impact can spread that soil around. And then we have sheet, rill, and gully erosion. Uh, sheet erosion is just running over the land and sort of picking it up as it flows over. And then really engulfs uh, rills really rills kind of were more at the top of the slope and gullies are going to happen at the bottom of the slope and going to be bigger. And then we also get it from wave action. So that can be some of the slumping. It can happen both from underneath and the top of the wave. So you're kind of uh, getting a double impact there uh, on your erosion. And then um, really when we think about accelerated erosion, when we clear the land and our hillsides, we, we're taking away the root structure that helps hold all that soil in place. Yes, this little video is just kind of a simple little demonstration in a stream trailer that we have. And I have one side with no, um, no vegetation along the stream. And then this side over here, I've got the vegetation. And you can actually see the difference. Um, and I realize it's, you know, plastic and it's, it's, I've designed it this way, but this is really kind of how it works. So if you go back and watch, you can see the sediment coming off because there's really nothing there to hold it in place. And, you know, if you've watched the news much in central Oklahoma around in, along the Cimarron River, we've actually seen some houses fall in as a result of this. And some of that comes from clearing that vegetation. And then when we make, have land use changes, we increase pervi impervious surface, so we're moving water faster. Um, we've converted a lot, especially in urban areas. Um, and I see it around Grand Lake as well. I see it around a lot of lakes and ponds. We wanna put turf grass in. Um, we're doing still conventional tillage, which means we go, we plant a crop, it grows, we harvest it, we till the ground and plant the new crop. Um, and then from construction sites. So that's kind of how accelerated erosion, erosion happens. And then this is just kind of, I have a couple of things here about the power of trees, uh, because again, I, I don't know if you all heard earlier, but I grew up over there in Locust Grove and it's the soil is, or lack there, as I like to say, is pretty similar. You know, you know, there's not a lot of soil. There's rocks and then there's smaller rocks and then even smaller rocks and then maybe some sand. Um, but these, these two locations are side by side and it's actually on 412 as you head um, east out of Locust Grove right across from Pipe Springs Park. But you can see over here we've still got some trees and where we don't have trees you start seeing the erosion happening and it's it's a little bit harder to tell from the picture, but there's been some slumping happening here. Um, this used to not have any vegetation on it, so it's actually getting a little bit better and as that vegetation comes on, then that will help reduce some of that erosion coming off of that. But if you can imagine if that was like a clay hill, um, how much sediment would be coming off of that. And then I did a little study. I was trying to find um, a really bare hillside um, where the trees have been cut. You can just see kind of the rocks and gravel similar to this. And so I just did a quick little Google search 
for gravel on a hillside. And this is the first thing that popped up. I just took a screenshot of it because I thought it was pretty interesting because it was all about how to stabilize a hillside. So either terrace it or put in some kind of grid. This one is a, a gravel lock something. Um, but I just thought it was interesting that when you try to search for something like that and, that, and I searched a couple of different ways and got very similar results, that what you see is how you're going to stabilize that. So it does tell you that the trees can make a difference. So this is actually on Grand Lake. It's a hillside. Um, and you can kind of see there's lots of trees in there. It's actually a pretty steep slope. It's, it's on a bluff. So it and it's actually terraced. But you can kind of tell that with all the vegetation in there, it's not really going anywhere. And it's been there for a while. And then uh, this is more along um, a river. And you can, the thing about this is you can see first how close the house is and the building over here is to the water's edge now. You can see how cut down that bank is. The other thing you can see, it's a little bit hard to tell, but the one thing you don't see in this picture are a lot of roots coming down. So what we've got here is mostly turf grass with very shallow roots and not a lot of structure holding it in place. And then what you are also starting to see is they've put this concrete wall in here, but actually if you get back around behind it, you can see it's starting to erode back around that. And this is another area on Grand Lake, and um, you can kind of see they've built this retaining wall around it to help keep their, uh, their property protected. But what's beginning to happen is it's beginning to erode underneath. And eventually what's going to happen is that's going to collapse in. And it may take a long time, but eventually that's going to happen. So uh, both from the wave action and from the choices of type of vegetation and the lack of vegetation can have an impact. So um, here's just another example of, you know, some shoreline on the lake. And we were just out on the lake, I was taking pictures. So this isn't, um, this isn't a comment on anyone's practices, but it's just an example of, you know, we don't have any vegetation. What I will say about the Grand Lake shoreline is it's pretty gravelly, right? So it's very different. For example, I live near Lake Thunderbird in central Oklahoma, and it's, it's very, um, it's a, a lot of clay here. So when, when there's no vegetation along that shoreline, you can actually watch the color of the water change with every wave because it pulls in so much soil. That doesn't exactly happen the same way in Grand Lake and other lakes that are more rocky, but you do still get some erosion. And, and this is an example. Um, if you look at this pipe, it's clearly been there for a while. It was initially very deeper and you can see that the concrete, it's ro eroded around the concrete. And at some point, eventually it's gonna probably fall down. So you are still getting that erosion even with those, uh, especially with those waves. Uh, we were out on a really calm day, so I didn't get any good uh, video of real good wave action, but just the beating of that water along the shoreline can have an impact. And that can be both from just the force of the wind, but it also is accelerated with the amount of boats that can be on the lake. So if I was out there maybe Labor Day, we would really be able to see a lot more of the impacts of the waves. And then this is just another example where um, they're doing some new construction. They've, they've cleared some vegetation off below the house and you can actually start seeing it um, kind of slumping down into uh, the shoreline down below. And you can see over here uh, where they haven't done any work that it's even starting to slump a little bit. So it's just as we, especially on those slopes, as we remove that vegetation, we're opening ourselves up to having some um, issues in the future. And this is actually, um, uh, somebody emailed me these pictures uh, this week or last week, maybe it was this week, and this is his shoreline and he's actually got some vegetation coming in and he's really interested to know because they're kind of scratchy weeds, I'm not sure what they are. Um, but he's wanting to know what he can plant there uh, in place of those weeds. And what you'll see a lot of times, especially after a large flood event, is it's carrying seeds from who knows where onto your land and you'll get who knows what 
popping up there. So some of these may be um, undesirable things and we can um, help you figure out what some of the better things are to help uh, reduce that erosion. And then this is actually on the Illinois River and it's just kind of a, again, sort of an example of what happens. We've left the riparian alone area alone kind of up here. So we have some vegetation. We have a little bit of erosion, but not as much. But this is actually a public use area and there's actually a road right up here that I think they've had to close now. Um, and you can just see that, you know, there's nothing there to help hold uh, this soil in place. Now, some of this is the result of some really um, pretty good flooding that has happened there in the last few years. Um, but there had been at one point, um, uh, they had tried to repair this and, and it, it hasn't held. Uh, I think we just couldn't get the vegetation in place. And then I wanna talk just a little bit about the power of roots. Um, when you think about native vegetation, the root systems are quite significant in a lot of cases. Um, they're deep, they're fibrous, um, they're, they're bulky, and they'll help really kind of bind all that soil in place. Uh, so for example, this one right here is actually switchgrass, um, and you can see how deep the roots go. This over here, this is our turf grass. This could be Kentucky bluegrass, this could be Bermuda grass, um, but as you can see, our root system on that grass, turf grass, is very short. Part of that is because of how we maintain it. Every time you mow it, you inhibit the growth of the roots. So if you leave it really short, your, root, your roots can't grow. Um, I read something the other day where um, it takes about 17 days. Once, you've, once it's gotten to a certain point, it takes 17 days for the roots to start growing again um, as the grass grows. So, with our turf grass and the way we manage it, we don't have good deep root systems. Um, I was looking to see if I had some, uh, this one is buffalo grass, which is, can be used as a turf grass. I don't think it will do well in that part of the state because I think it's um, a little bit too wet, but even it um, you know, has some nice thick roots and, and some deep root systems. Um, big and little blue stem have really deep root systems. There's um, uh, pictures of blue stem where the, the root system itself is eight feet. That's what's under the ground. And so they really can make a difference. And it's not just the, the vegetation, but the trees as well. So um, both the, you know, herbaceous perennials and shrubs, but trees also are going to be able to make a difference. And then I want to talk just quickly, and I know I'm talking pretty fast, but I want to give Bruce plenty of time to talk about uh, vegetation. I just want to talk, touch on GRDA's requirements and restrictions because they do have a shoreline management plan and within that they have vegeta a vegetation management plan. And that plan is in uh, subchapter seven of GRDA's rules. So you have to have a permit actually to do any um, very much vegetation management on the GRDA property, um, the, the um, project land that they have. So uh, if it, whether it's removing trees or, or changing the types of vegetation, you do have to get a permit for that. And then also within their rules, um, they, on the GRDA project land, you know, herbicides can be used, pesticides aren't allowed, um, sales of trees or other vegetation is not allowed, fertilizers are not to be applied, um, vegetable gardens are not allowed on GRDA, DA land, and then the introduction of invasive species is prohibited. And that's uh, pretty important. I was actually in Texas a few weeks ago um, speaking with a tribe down there. They have a lake and somebody years ago, probably in the 90s, planted elephant here along the shoreline. And now it is going, it's gotten so bad that it's choking out um, the spring that feeds the lake. And so they're having some real issues with how to manage that elephant ear. So um, that might not be considered necessarily an invasive species, but it's gotten very aggressive out there. But there are things that you don't want to plant um, and shouldn't plant. And you, there's an invasive species council that has a list and you can contact GRDA and they can tell you others. And this uh, picture here was also sent by someone at the lake and um, this person has used herbicide to kill the vegetation along the shoreline. So, and that can have an impact on water quality as well. It's not just the erosion, but if that herbicide and pesticides get in the water, it can have a negative impact on the life in there. 
Um, and then again, just um, you have to be careful about what kind of uh, machinery you use. So I just wanted you to be aware that there are some rules out there. It's easy to find on GRDA's website. If you have any trouble with it, feel free to email me and I'm happy to direct you uh, where to go or put you in contact with the right person to answer your questions. And then the last thing I really want to talk about is the zones of uh, the freshwater shoreline, just to kind of give you an idea, and Bruce may cover this as well, that what you have is um, what's called the littoral zone, and it's kind of that, that shallow area before it starts getting um, deep where your normal elevation pool is. Things like eelgrass are going to be grown down in there, and those submerged vegetation um, really can help with um, wave action. They also provide um, food and habitat for uh, fish and the bugs that, that live in that part of the lake, um, especially the small fish. They like to go up into the shallows and hide in the vegetation from the larger fish. And then you're going to have the emergent area, um, which are plants whose roots can stay wet all the time, but they emerge out of the water. So you all might think about cattails. That's one. Um, those can get pretty um, uh, invasive uh, can kind of take over an area, but there's some others that are, are good to plant in that area. And then you have the riparian area, and that's gonna be that area kind of, um, if you can see there's a high water mark here, that's gonna be just kind of um, above your normal pool and um, just a little bit above your high water mark. And those are gonna be plants that can have their feet wet for a while, uh, but also um, can stand it when there's not water on them. And then you have the upland area where you're going to have most of your trees and things like that. So those are kind of the different zones of the shoreline. And then what you plant in there is going to be particular to that zone. So we can pull this up again at the end, but this is just my contact information, my email. Um, there's also one for Guard the Grand at grda.com and my phone number. Uh, again, I'll put this up at the end, but I wanna, I wanna turn it over to Bruce now. My name is Bruce Hoagland, or as you can even see on your screen, um, as Jerry pointed out, I'm coordinator of the Oklahoma Natural Heritage Inventory. I'm also a professor in the Department of Geography. I'm also the Associate Chair of the Department of Geography. Um, I have been doing field work in Oklahoma since 1989, and most of my research is, has focused on wetland habitats. Uh, my dissertation and thesis work involved uh, plant communities uh, on, uh, in, in wetlands. Um, both in Lake Itasca, Minnesota, and in the Playa Lakes of Western Oklahoma. This is not a lake, but it's just a real pretty part of the Arbuckle Mountains. So um, I want to do two things tonight. I want to talk about uh, lake vegetation, but I also want you to uh, know a little bit about what the Oklahoma Natural Her Heritage Inventory is. Um, we are a state agency. Uh, we became a state agency in 19. 87. Um, but the heritage program uh, first appeared in the state, actually in the Department of Tourism, in 1977. And we were one of the first 11 heritage programs in the United States. So every state and some other jurisdictions have a heritage inventory. Um, and we all pretty much do the uh, I have similar goals and objectives is what, what I'm trying to stutter. Um, as you can see here, uh, what we do is uh, provide a centralized and continually updated inventory of the biological diversity of the state. And that actually has some um, uh, economic as well as environmental and ecological importance because um, if you are say a construction company, and you receive federal funds uh, for a project, the first organization you contact in Oklahoma is the Heritage Inventory to determine if there is a known population of threatened or endangered species within that footprint. Um, this is, this is the, the crew. This is um, Amy Buto, uh, a botanist. Liz Berge that works with invertebrates. Uh, Todd Fagan is our uh, conservation data analyst, is his current title. Um, 
this esteemed fellow is the coordinator. Uh, Brenda Smith is the, um, she has two, two roles. Uh, she's the uh, vertebrate zoologist, so she handles uh, vertebrate related issues for us, but um, she also works, uh, primarily she works with invertebrates. And in fact, in the coming months, um, a book on the uh, dragonflies, the Odinates of Oklahoma, uh, will be coming out um, that she, ha she has written with some co-authors. So, um, so a little plug for her book there. If you like dragonflies, then th this is the book for you. And this is the official cat herder of the outfit. So. Uh, Trina, Trina Style, who just actually retired recently. Um, I mentioned that these other programs have a, or other states have a heritage program. We all kind of operate um, under an umbrella organization called NatureServe. Um, there's a nice little infographic they've, they've uh, generated, um, but uh, NatureServe, has a product called NatureServe Explorer, which is a, a, a very nice uh, portal for learning more about the species in the state, in the nation, and in the hemisphere. Um, and they just revamped it, so it's very uh, nice uh, and usable. What we do, what each biologist does then, is, is we rank the conservation status of all the plants and animals in Oklahoma. Uh, we rank it on uh, our, oops, see, rank, of, rank, uh, rank those species at two levels. Um, the global level, which represents the entire range of the species, and then the state level within our jurisdiction. And so if you visit our webpage, you'll see that, um, you'll see this alphabet alphanumeric soup, G1, G2, S, S1, S2. And those translate roughly as um, an S1, G1 species is critically imperiled by extreme rarity versus those that are demonstrably secure throughout their range. And since I'm a geography professor, I'm obligated to show uh, maps. Uh, if I don't show maps, I think I lose my tenure. Um, but this is the distribution of the um, federally listed threatened and endangered species um, that we track. And these are some examples of species we track. These aren't all um, listed as threatened or endangered. Uh, some of them are, but, um, and you may recognize some of them. So as I mentioned, I've been working in the state for 30 plus years, this, this map, is a very good representation of what we call potential nat natural vegetation. It was actually published um, with the title Game Type Map of Oklahoma. And this map was developed um, pretty much in the wake of the Dust Bowl. Jack Duck and um, his colleague Flet uh, John Fletcher basically drove the state. Fletcher worked eastern Oklahoma. He was uh, headquartered out of Adair County and then Jack Duck was in uh, Stillwater and I spoke to Jack Duck's daughter once many many years ago and she said her dad had a special room that the kids could never go in. It was just full of maps and their field notes um, and of course they were kids so they went in as soon as dad said don't go in. I rely on this map all the time um, and I like to show it because it represents, uh, I should say, it's a good depiction of the environmental gradients in the state, particularly our precipitation gradient. Um, highest precipitation down here in the southeast corner of the state, 50, 55 plus inches a year, all the way out to uh, 12 inches per year. Uh, but the annual evaporation rate in this part of the state is 77 inches per year, uh, whereas it's much warmer and humid and uh, I should say it's much more humid in eastern Oklahoma, so the evaporation stress isn't uh, quite as great. I do like to point out that there are wetlands in uh, throughout Oklahoma. Uh, this is a Playa Lake Basin in the shortgrass prairie portion of the state in the Panhandle. Um, 
very important for migratory waterfowl. As you can see, uh, when conditions are right, uh, farmers just plow right through them and plant wheat um, and other crops. And you can kind of tell where the ply is because the wheat will be even height and then you'll have these little short stubby guys that are dealing with the clay and the wetter soils. These are similar, this is a similar uh, type of hydrology, but this is a interdunal swale wetland that we find on the north side of our rivers in uh, western and central Oklahoma. And again, they're, they're seasonally wet, um, but very important to migratory waterfowl. In uh, eastern Oklahoma, we have some really unique wetland types down um, around Antlers, Audubel. Um, there are some ancient sand dunes, sand deposits, where um, we have these seep uh, wetlands that uh, local people refer to as bogs. And just like a bog, you can stand on one of these mats of vegetation and bounce up and down and it waves uh, because of all the water uh, beneath. And of course, um, in the far southeast corner of Oklahoma, we have native cypress swamps. So you feel like you're in East Texas or Louisiana. It was at one of these locations that I learned a very important lesson and that is that I have the power to teleport. Um, about eight years ago, I was down at the Red Slough Wildlife Management Area, and there was a report of one of the first female nesting American alligators. And so went down with a colleague. Uh, we were doing a plant inventory at the time, saw where the nest is. And an important lesson is that um, if you're going to visit an alligator nest, consult with a herpetologist, not a botanist, in terms of when the young have left the nest. Um, my assumption would have been correct if we had lived in Florida, that the young were already gone, but since we're on the northwest edge of the range, they hadn't left yet. So I'm looking at the nest, my colleague screams out, look in the water, and just then out comes this alligator who we've named Bubbles. Um, and I knew that I had teleported because one second I was standing next to the nest and then suddenly I was next to my car. So obviously I teleported somehow, but being a science nerd, I took a picture. We want to talk about today though, are kind of these large uh, reservoirs, you know, native lakes um, and uh, our reservoirs share a lot of the same species. But as Jerry was pointing out, uh, the dynamics in our larger reservoirs are very different uh, in terms of the fluctuation in water level. So whereas uh, Western Oklahoma wetlands are going to be very subjected to uh, evaporation, the lakes, uh, the managed lakes are uh, going to be subjected to just water management, right, as well as precipitation inputs. And it's that fluctuation that's going to uh, dictate if there are even plants present. I know that, um, I don't know if Jerry, if you and I have talked about this, but many years ago, um, I was approached by some folks from GRDA about a, a large uh, mud flat area toward the back of the, the lake that they had tried to uh, vegetate for several years without much success. Maybe they've had success since then, but. Um, this was an area that experienced water going, you know, fluctuating pretty rapidly. And it's hard for plants to get established uh, in those conditions because some are well adapted for water retreating and some are well adapted for water standing. But for water going back and forth, um, it just confuses seeds. The seeds get all confused. They come up when they shouldn't. And so... Uh, Jerry mentioned the uh, zonation that we see in vegetation. This, this is a very idealized cross-section um, of, uh, of, of, a, of a lake. Uh, we go from this uh, submerged vegetation, we see this pattern in Oklahoma, up to what they're referring to as low marsh, so plants that just get above the water, uh, to uh, what we would call emergent wetlands, so the plants that 
grow with most of their above ground parts above water level um, up into uh, swamp forests. Um, here we refer to swamp for what they're calling swamp forests as bottomland hardwood forests and those are occupied by very um, uh, groups of trees that are well adapted to uh, having their roots wet for extended periods of time up around uh, Grand Lake, uh, pin oak is going to be a very important bottom than hardwood species. As we go from uh, Grand Lake down toward uh, southeastern Oklahoma, pin oaks become uh, less common, but we have another group of oaks uh, that are very important in the bottomlands there, as well as some, some hickories. I'm not going to talk as much about the forest. I just want to give you um, some uh, um, indication of what sorts of plants you might find in that shoreline situation uh, because what's going on especially along a, a reservoir um, conditions aren't always conducive to the trees like the picture I just had up of Beaver's Bend Reservoir you know the slopes are kind of steep and so trees may begin to grow uh, but depending on that slope and the, the wave action, uh, Jerry described a very important phenomenon um, that most natural lakes don't experience, and that's boating way, uh, wakes, you know. <laughs> so these are things that if you're going to be a really large tree, it's kind of hard to be a large tree if something's always washing uh, at the base of your, uh, your trunk. I got real nostalgic getting ready for this talk. Um, there is a was a professor at OU named William T. Penfound, who was very interested in um, categorizing the types of vegetation that are associated with um, our lakes in Oklahoma. And in 1953, he published this paper um, that, um, oh, Dred, I'm forgetting how many, he visited many of the impoundments, um, as well as some of the natural lakes and tried to catalog the types of plants he found and where in that kind of zonation scheme um, they were most common. And he found um, in his research from uh, east to west uh, 182 species of plants um, in that, that band of the lake he was surveying. Um, and again, it's important to remember that, you know, we go from plants that are very, very well adapted to, to constant water versus those that, um, you know, they get wet sometime or they may be wet for a short period of time. Um, it's kind of ironic, really, but um, as you know, plants can get too much water. And the reason, or uh, two things kind of, um, work to their detriment. One is the longer a, the soil is flooded, the less oxygen there is. And all plant roots require oxygen to grow. Um, some plants, uh, or plants that grow in those really wet conditions, have developed adaptations for pumping air down to their roots. Water lilies have a, a great way of creating this pre pressure gradient that pulls uh, oxygen in through the leaves and back into the roots. One reason that's important is that under these anaerobic or anoxic conditions is um, toxic compounds like iron and aluminum mobilize and th that is very destructive to the roots. And so when the plants pump this oxygen to the root um, and the little hair roots, the oxygen leaks out and it basically oxidizes that iron. So you'll see in a, in a true wetland, these little channels, these little rusty red channels that represent where the roots were growing. Um, this is an example of, well, I wanna say one other thing about Penfound. We've not had anyone repeat the sort of work that he's done. Um, the funding just had the interest is there. I'm very interested in doing it. Um, but acquiring the funds to 
undertake uh, a project like this um, it is just kind of difficult uh, to come by I'm sorry to say um, this is an example uh, of one of those gradients um, that was described by a man named Albert Little. Albert Little graduated from the University of Oklahoma in 1936 and went on to become a, um, a very well-known uh, dendrologist with the uh, U.S. Forest Service, published extensively on trees from Latin America, uh, but he always, uh, Latin America to Canada, but he always came home to Oklahoma and uh, did some work. He just, he, he just couldn't squeeze the sooner out of him. Um, so one of the areas that Penn found talks about is, is the recession zone. Sounds like a, a period in the economy or something, but um, I refer to these as drawdown areas. And um, he, he writes about the arrow period. So that means the time that the soils are exposed to um, the air. And what you see here is, and many of you have no doubt seen this along lakes, this is a shot from the Toka Lake, um, is just uh, these real muddy, sticky soil, because all these sediments have been moved from different places, right? So when you walk through them, you sink up to your knees. And, um, but you often get this real grassy flush of plants. And um, depending upon how long the soil has been exposed um, is going to determine which plants you see uh, because some plants are adapted to germinate and grow just right after the water's off the soil and then some kind of follow later. The taller ones come, come a bit later. Uh, this is a view from what's now called Blue Stem Lake. Uh, in Atoka County. It was known for years as Sub Penitentiary Lake because the women's prisons across the street. Um, but these are some of the small plants that first come up uh, when that soil's exposed. And these are members of the sedge family. Um, a lot of those early plants are going to be members of the sedge family um, or the grass family. Um, as time progresses, you'll see some other species pop up. Uh, the scarlet tooth cup, we have two species of tooth cup in Oklahoma, uh, is also common along these zones where the water is drawn down. Um, you'll see this little heliotrope growing in uh, a variety of wetland conditions, but sometimes they'll be really abundant in these drawdowns. Um, it's the name Indian heliotrope isn't, because, isn't a reference to Native Americans, it's because this plant is originally from India. So it's a non-native species that's uh, really proliferated in, in uh, wetlands in North America. It's not, um, it doesn't cause the same sort of jeopardy as like purple loose strife, but you'll see it in just about any uh, wetland location later in the summer, mid to late summer. Um, you also find these little guys um, growing in areas. This, uh, unlike some of the plants we saw uh, prior to this, which are uh, annual species, um, this, this guy is a perennial, and it's very popular with uh, blues um, and other small butterflies, um, as you can see in this particular picture but it forms a mat, so it grows low to the ground. It has these cable-ish like stems that root at the nodes. So when the water level comes up and down, it's still uh, firmly in place. Sometimes this will pop up in lawns too, um, kind of heavily irrigated lawns or places where someone might have a bit of a leaky, leaky uh, ir uh, head on their irrigation system. Uh, this plant is the lake manager's nightmare plant. Um, this is uh, known as coffee weed. It's in the legume family. And in eastern Oklahoma in particular, um, in late summer, this plant can just cover acres. Um, and it'll grow up to easily eight feet tall. And, uh, but that 
it needs that kind of early wetting of the seeds, but then for the water to leave. If the water stays much more than a few weeks, uh, a couple of weeks maybe even, um, it, it, won't, it won't persist. Uh, it can form just these dense stands. In fact, um, two years ago now, I was doing some work at the Nickel Preserve up by Tahlequah, and late in the summer, almost every cobble bar on the Illinois River was cloaked in a growth of this. Um, and I had a couple of colleagues, you know, ask, what is this plant? They were afraid it was a new non-native invasive plant that had <laughs> been introduced to the Illinois, but um, conditions were just right in that particular year for the seeds to germinate. They can lay dormant in the, the soil for quite a while, but yeah, that particular year was, was pretty impressive. Ed, you may have seen that, in fact. Um, some of my favorite vegetation occurs in this area that um, uh, Penn Foundry per referred to as short or no arrow period. And this is the, um, the emergent wetlands. And so this is an example from an area down in McCurtain County. Um, and you can see some of that uh, zonation uh, in this photo. So this is um, a plant called pennywort or hydrocaudal ranunculoides, which grows out into the water. It forms a floating mat, uh, especially in real stable water bodies that have quite a bit of nutrients in the water. You can kind of see this is dark tea stained water. You can uh, see the duckweeds back here, or the, some people refer to as arrowhead. And then as the uh, water becomes more shallow, we pick up common rush. And then here's our uh, kind of swamp, swampy shrubland, swampy forest just behind that. Um, one of the most common plants in Eastern Oklahoma, and I could not find my, one of my close-up photos of this, is uh, American water willow. Any stream that has riffles, rocky riffles, or lakes that have kind of a rocky uh, substrate or fairly stable shoreline, like uh, that, uh, Lake Francis, will just have huge amounts of, of water willow growing on it. So um, just about any stream that you see in eastern Oklahoma, it looks like a lawn almost uh, out on out on the uh, rivers and, and, and along some lake shorelines. Another plant that's really common and that butterflies are quite fond of and other pollinators is uh, swamp smart weed. Um, used to be Polygonum hypericoides, but botanists like to change names of plants. I think it's called job security. Um, but this also will form floating mats as well. Um, in a couple of locations in far southeast Oklahoma, uh, growing up uh, in between these stems is one of the, is the only orchid that's considered to be a true aquatic plant, Habenaria repens. Um, and it kind of, it, it uses these mats for support. And when it's out in the water, it only grows uh, in mats of vegetation. And I know of one site that, I kid you not, has thousands of those orchids. It's just ridiculous. I've never seen them. Uh, orchids don't grow in abundance, but this did. Uh, this one ties at that site. This is also an extremely common plant um, in eastern Oklahoma. Um, it says common rush, Juncus effusus. Sometimes it'll grow in these real dense um, uh, stands like we see here. Sometimes you may just see some individual clumps depending upon the um, water depth. Uh, never be fooled though. Um, that may look like fairly stable ground right there, but um, you will sink, up, sink into it. So uh, the interesting thing about many of these mats of vegetation is they begin to sink in the winter, um, not only from 
uh, or because the plants themselves are dying, but a lot of the decomposition that's happening in the system is slowing down. And part of what buoys those mats is the gases that are trapped in the roots that are coming up from um, the soil. So if you've ever waded through a swamp, you know, so if you hit, if you step on a, sometimes when you step on the soil, you will release these bubbles, these bubbles of gas will come up and that's what's getting trapped um, under the, the roots. Those bubbles also always lead to the infamous who, who farted joke because it's hydrogen sulfide, which is produced because of that, uh, those anaerobic conditions that I mentioned. This grass is also very common in Eastern Oklahoma. It's uh, uh, very closely re related to wild rice, hence the name Southern wild rice. Some people call it rice, um, giant rice cut grass. Uh, the, the margins of the stem are very, uh, uh, they have little spines on them that, yeah, they, they, will, they will cut you. We have another plant that's called cut grass, uh, Lyrzea or Rhizoides, that'll grow in wetlands also. When I was working on my master's, a herpetologist went in the field with me and he was wearing shorts and just totally sliced up his legs walking through this stuff. This is um, the soft stem bulrush, a common, really tall, grown again, up to um, eight feet tall. It can grow from really from four to eight feet, depending on the water conditions. This is down by Tuscahoma, southeast Oklahoma. And of course, the other, especially waterfowl managers, have no love for broadleaf cat for any of the cattails. Um, we have three species of cattail in the state, northern cattails, southern, and broadleaf, and they all hybridize. So we, we get um, what are referred to as hybrid swarms um, of these cattails. And in the continuous water zones, um, this is um, one of the pond weeds, one of the more common pond weeds. And many of the plants in the continuous water zone especially those with floating leaves, require fairly stable water conditions. They're not very well adapted to fluctuating water levels. Um, so if you want to see a nice uh, patch of uh, spatter dock, new far ludium, or um, water lilies, they usually are in these more stable situations than in our larger reservoirs, for example. If you do see them, they'll be more toward the back, uh, more sheltered cove kind of situation. Uh, the only two woody plants I'll mention is the ubiquitous black willow, which um, you'll find on pretty much every lake and, um, and anywhere where the water, um, sorry, the soil stays wet enough for the seeds to germinate. Oftentimes they'll form an even age stand. There's, um, a black willow forest just out of outside of Ralston in Pawnee County. Hundreds of trees, all the same height, and they were uh, kind of at the uh, willows have the uh, grow fast, die young kind of approach to uh, dealing with nature. And so, yeah, when you get in these large willow forests, you have to watch out for branches falling out of the trees. And our other fast grower, of course, is the eastern cotton. Cottonwood, which isn't as common in streamside and wetland habitats in eastern Oklahoma as it is out west. It's kind of, it is the common tree out west, but there are other species it's kind of competing with um, in the eastern part of the state, several other species. Thank you. I hope that was informative. <laughs> One of the things that I've been asked a lot is what what specific maybe types of plants would be good to plant along the shoreline in the Grand Lake area, given that it's kind of um, rocky? <laughs> Is there something that works really well over there uh, plant-wise? For example, if somebody really wanted to, uh, like the pictures that I showed earlier that I said somebody had sent it to me and he had some really kind of rough kind of weeds and he wants to replace it with something else, what might be something good that he could use? It's, you know, it's a, it's a, especially in those, uh, not just rocky, but the steeper slope areas, it's going to be a constant mm -hmm. battle. You can't go wrong by sticking some willows in those locations. 
as well as um, some button bush. Oh shoot, I forgot to show my button bush mm -hmm. picture because it's uh, an excellent plant for pollinators, uh, especially button bush yeah. that has its feet a little wet, apparently produces more nectar and it can just be covered. They can, uh, I've seen dozens of swallowtails on a button bush. But yeah, I think you, you, just, it's, you just have to be prepared to keep, you know, kind of putting stuff out, doing a little trial and error to see which plant's going to work best if you if you have a situation where it could be rocky but a little more level mm -hmm. maybe not as susceptible to rapid fluctuations you, you have a broader palette of things um, like many of the plants i showed here like the the common rush mm -hmm. of course cattails there are a number of things that you can you can try but you know if, if, when you see that steep slope you have to remember that that slope keeps going so <laughs> <laughs> and that's yeah. that's one of the that's actually one of the techniques for controlling aquatic plants like cattails and other things around um, you know man-made ponds and stuff they'll go in and cut like a three foot steep sod because most plants don't do well with that thank you for watching our video on shoreline erosion and vegetation management. We have several other workshops available on our Grand River Dam Authority YouTube channel. One on landscaping for water quality and conservation. One on the Adopt the Shoreline program and about boat and dock maintenance. One on understanding your watershed, the Grand Lake watershed, and a two-part series on septic system maintenance. For more information on the Guard the Grand program, you can visit our website at grda.com and look for Guard the Grand on the right-hand side. Thank you again, and we look forward to you helping us guard the grand.